Hello, everyone. You're listening to The Small Business Show. My name is Swire Ho. You can also call me the promo guy. My guest today is Christopher Lunar from the Los Angeles area of Chamber of Commerce. Chris is a seasoned entrepreneur with a rich background in community engagement and networking. From his root in Mexican product industry to working in major corporation and now serving as a member relationship representative of the LA Chamber, Chris's journey is a testament to resilient and strategic relationship building. With a mission to uplift entrepreneur and empower community, he shared valuable lessons in entrepreneurship, networking, and leveraging local chamber of commerce for growth. His extensive LinkedIn network and commitment to collaborate ensure that he, he will share insights readily, readily, and offering listeners the opportunity to learn from his expertise. Good morning, Christopher. Thank you. Thank you very much for having me today. And uh, thank you for all your support too at the chamber. Um, you know, as a chamber ambassador, you do quite a bit. And I want to make sure we highlight that we have the opportunity to talk about that as well. Thank you so much. Uh, love to learn more about your background. You you got me hooked, right? You know, you work at you know major corporation in the finance industry and then in the family business. And now uh, you're working at the LA Chamber. Can you tell us more about that? Yes. So I was born and raised in the family business. Um, my parents were one of the pioneers to import a lot of the Hispanic products, um, starting with Hispanic groceries. A lot of those um, brands like um, from Procter & Gamble or Jarritos, uh, North Suiza, a lot of the detergents and soaps and whatnot. So they started in the Hispanic grocery um, industry. So anytime you would go to a Vons or Ralph's or Food for Less, a lot of the big grocery chains, if you walk down that Hispanic aisle, a lot of that was from them. Um, so they were uh, one of the first pioneers to that. That changed over time. They got into the candy side of things. Um, again, bringing in a lot of those um, original products like uh, De La Rosa, Mazapans, um, Pelones, Lucas, a lot of the pe people who are familiar with the Mexican candy, they'll, they'll know those names. Um, and they started in a van. You know, my dad would go to Mexico, load up his van, bring it over to the state and um, transport it throughout different uh, areas in the LA region, uh, mostly to small mom and pop stores. And that kind of just grew to a fleet of trucks. Um, so my parents were, were quite big at some time. Um, that started in the 80s. I took over the family business um, in 2012. So I maintained and managed that for 12 years along with my brothers. And but prior to that, um, you know, while I was going to college and and, and studying, I was in banking and insurance. Um, so that kind of got me into the, you know, actually that, that's what got me into this role currently. Um, when I was in banking, I would go to the Chamber of Commerce quite a bit and, and a lot of meetings and, and just networking in general. And that's how I met my VP. Um, she's been there for 43 years. I always say she is um, the Chamber. Um, she's uh, such an inspiration and I know you work with her quite a bit. And I had the opportunity to work with her directly. So it's an honor and it's um, it's great to kind of have that transition to the chamber. Yeah, Pat is wonderful. And the reason I have you on today, we love to talk about business networking. You're the expert of business networking. And if you have not seen Chris Network, uh, go to one of the events that he attend, you know, ask if he, if you could shadow him. And then you'll be amazed and you'll learn a lot of wonderful skills in networking. But for before we dive into that, you know, I, I wanted to kind of set the stage, right? Uh, a lot of us have been doing Zoom meetings for the last, you know, two, three years. And now in-person events and in-person networking got back to full force. So with so many options available, how would you advise one to first to find the right networking event to attend? I mean, because there's so many of them. Definitely. I think... It depends on your industry. Um, depending on where you're coming from, there's always trade shows and um, conferences um, that are within that industry. So I would start there, but I wouldn't get stuck in that bubble. What happened with me when I was in the candy industry, that was all I was doing. I was going to the same candy convections, going to the same areas in Chicago every year after year after year, or in Mexico year after year after year, and you seeing the same people. And in reality, to me, obviously, a lot of my customers came from there and a lot of my vendors came from there. But you want to network outside of your industry um, because you'll never know um, who you're who you're going to meet. And a lot of times there's less competition. So, for example, if I was in the candy industry, I want to network with the 
uh, hospitality industry. You want to go and, and get involved in the hotel chains and have the opportunity to pitch them your candy so they can offer it at their lobbies or in their hotel rooms. So there's always different avenues to, to your approach. So I think just to kind of get used to the momentum of networking, um, starting with your industry associations and, and trade shows would be a start. Also, the chambers. Um, you know, the chambers offer that wide, vast network and they tap into so many different industries and so many different sectors. And it's always great to start with your local chamber of commerce. I mean, that would be, um, you know, probably close to step one as well. Yeah. My, my approach is pretty straightforward. I follow the money, right? If you ask me, you know, what <laughs> event are you going to go to? I said, you know, mm -hmm. who can bring our company the most revenue? You know, what, what I mean by that is I, I looked at, you know, and I think you're correct, uh, Chris. If I go mm -hmm. to, let's say, some well-known promotional product uh, uh, event, right? Every mm -hmm. of my competitor is going to be there. There's going to be tons of competition. Are there events that if I attend, I'm the only promotional product person? So I figure because we're in Los Angeles and if you've been in LA for the past five years, you know that there are a lot of construction mm -hmm. and we will be hosting the uh, 2028 uh, Olympics in LA. So a lot of infrastructure. So mm -hmm. I come to conclusion that uh, about three years ago that construction company are going to have a lot of money and I can sell to construction companies. So it was my mission to attend construction networking. You know, sometimes they'll look at me, why, why are you there? You not, you don't do <laughs> the drywall, you don't do all the mm -hmm. um, heavy lifting that we do. But I was able to make a lot of connection that worthwhile for my time. Because at the end, if we're talking about business networking, we, we want result, right? We want business, we want the mm -hmm. revenue. So I think, you know, that's my kind of straightforward approach looking at it. Definitely. I think... Um... Like I said, you want to get out of your bubble and it's always about less competition. If you're in the room with hundreds of people that do the same thing, it's going to be a lot more competitive for you to get that time of day with those vendors or those potential customers. So if you are have that niche and you're able to focus in that specific industry and you become that go-to person where all these different construction companies and not only construction companies, but there's public, public and private agencies and transportation um, that opens up your, your world, right? So I think that um, being known for that specialty outside of your wheelhouse um, is what's gonna get you highlighted for sure. Mm -hmm. So let's talk about the preparation before you, let's say Chris, uh, for you, right? When you attend a uh, business networking event, what kind of preparation do you do like can you walk us through through the process definitely don't go to an event that you know nothing about um that's it's it's a little rude to the people who are hosting it um but do your homework um a lot of times i'm just going to refer to some chamber events that we host um there's it's either a conference or a summit of some sort but see who's on the panel, see who's keynoting, what are they about, where do they come from, um, and, and really do your research into those people that are there presenting, right? Because they're giving their 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 time and, and they're really wanting to help others. But if you know nothing about them, it's going to throw things off and, and, it, and it helps with your conversation as well. Um, what I look at, and just because that's my background, is I'm looking who's sponsoring the events, right? Who's mm. supporting these events? Um, especially you being in promotions, right? If you see these um, hospitals uh, sponsoring this conference, who, well, who's that point of contact from that hospital, right? Um, maybe they would be a great person to reach out to and offer um, maybe some, some assistance in your promotional items, right? So it's always who's sponsoring and who's really attached to the event and research that. I admit, sometimes I, I, I go to so many events where I don't really take you know, a, a dedicated amount of time. Um, but I'll, uh, you know, I'll pull over or right before I walk in, I'll just scroll through real quick. And I'm like, okay, I need to see that person or I want to approach this person, or I'll kind of come up with some talking points um, just based on the research that I've, def, uh, I've done on that event. So definitely uh, research a little bit prior to attending an event like that. Yeah, I really like that approach. And, you know, especially, you know, speaking for myself, in, in my time, you know, being a member at the LA Chamber, you know, there are different council, right? Different meetings. So if I attend, you know, pancakes and politics, for example, uh, I might meet some politicians. If I go to like small business council, obviously 
a lot of small business. And, you know, sometimes we'll have nonprofit, you know, uh, workshop too. So I know that nonprofits are be there. So I would kind of go into my thinking cap, you know, who can I meet uh, that will be good as a customer? Mm -hmm. Who can I meet uh, can be good as a partner? Because sometimes I'll be on the lookout for my customer, right? If they're mentioned that they're trying to I find a nonprofit to donate, right, for at the end of the year. So I'll actually be on the lookout for that. So, you know, I like the approach, like spend some time, you know who's going to be there. And sometimes you guess, right, who mm -hmm. uh, probably the if they are sponsoring, uh, the whole team is going to be there. Who am I going to run into? And, you know, what kind of conversations should I should I start with them? Yeah, definitely. And, and that's a good question just with the sponsors, too, is if you go to, um, uh, you know, a, a women's policy event, and you see this company, ABC Bank, sponsoring. Um, why are they sponsoring it? What attached them to that event, right? Try to understand the meaning behind the conversation before you even get into a sales approach. Um, and it, it really opens that door and communicating with these people where they're willing to share with you their background, their experience, and what got them to sponsor an event like that. It's very meaningful when a company sponsors these events because there's it, it helps with the event in general, but there's a reason behind that. So I'm always curious to know what is the objective and having these great organizations support these nonprofits that way or, or in a certain area, right? Um, so I think that's, that helps with your talking points as well. Okay. I want to ask you this question, and I think you're the perfect person to answer it. Do you, are you a supporter for a traditional uh, physically printed pr uh, business card, or are you a barcode scanning phone guy uh, for for your content information? Okay. Both this is what <laughs> I do. Okay, um, so I'm at my my home office right now, and um, what I'll do is when I get a bunch of business cards, I'll put a, a post it and I'll say where I met them and the date that I met them, and they'll start piling up. Right, um, these are great because. Physical cards are always good because when I get, I mean, I'm just talking about me in general, I get mm -hmm. home or, or my office and I'll plug them into a system and uh, I'll send them an email right away, just kind of reintroducing myself or it was great meeting you. Please feel free to save my information. Use me as a resource. I never make a sale or, or a sales pitch, right? I always say, if you want to learn more about what I do, or I would love to learn more about you and your role, your organization. Um, that's my follow-up, but talking about the business cards, physical cards are great. Um, digital cards are also great because I run out of cards, right? So that's kind of my plan B because it, it really depends on the person. You'll see who you're interacting with. If there's someone that's very technology driven and they're, they're, they understand they, they use it themselves, then it'll, it'll probably be easier to do a QR code, right? Um, the issue that I have with when I scan QR codes is I'll forget who I scanned. So mm -hmm. I'll save it to my phone. And if I may, met John Doe, well, there's so many other more John Doe's on my cell phone, right? So I have thousands of contacts on my phone and I'll forget who it is. So I'll have to remember to screenshot it right after I scan it. So I remember the day that I met that person or what their name was, because I'll go home and I'll be like, geez, I forgot that person's name. What, who was it? Who was it? And then I'm scrolling through a list of contacts. I'll never find them. So physical cards are always great um, in that sense because you're able to, even at the event, you're able to take a quick note. Um, and and I've heard people really like they'll make, they'll, like they'll put it in different pockets. Like if you put it in your right side pocket, it's like follow up with that person. <laughs> like your yeah. left side of the pocket, I try like, that sometimes, yes. You know, so there's different um, techniques to it. I've heard people bending cards. Um, but you could simply just make a star or a note on it. Um, but there's there's definitely different techniques to it. But I prefer both. I think uh, if you're in sales in general, you should probably have both. Mm -hmm. um, I think physical cards are, are, are really important. I've, I've gone some time without them because, you know, say so it'll take some time for our, our marketing department to reorder them or whatnot. Um, but I, I you'll have those people like, I need a card. Like they don't want to scan your card or your phone mm -hmm. or go through that whole process. So. Yeah, I like that. And sometimes for the cell phone part, I'll, I'll, I'll leave it at that, right? So depending on the location, sometimes there might be no reception, right? Mm -hmm. So if you rely uh, internet connection to scan or send it somewhere to sip it somewhere, mm -hmm. it might not work. So there are there are times that, you know, we both have a phone out for like a good 
three minutes, right? But mm. we're trying to like nervously smiling at each other, but our phone <laughs> wouldn't connect. So you know, it happens sometimes. So that's you, why I wanted to ask you that question. Yeah, or you're training them like, okay, scan it, scroll down, save it. Sometimes that save button is not the actual save button. So you still got to hit done or something, right? Because sometimes it doesn't scan it. So there is definitely a learning curve still to it. But I, I do definitely re recommend both. Mm. So Chris, you have been to a lot of meetings. You, you know, you're well known in the uh, business community. But for uh, some of us who haven't attended a lot of events like you, when we work into an event after we checked in, what should we do? Like, what's the first thing that we do? Um, I, I, I always try. So if you go in early, you always want to try to hit and speak to the people who are part of the event. Thank them for inviting you. Um, thank you for for hosting the event. Again, if you see a sponsor, oh, that's great. Thank you for sponsoring. Or how did you get involved? Talk to the people who are involved in the meeting, right? Um, those are typically people who are there early anyways because they're setting up or whatnot. Um, once the event gets into, into play, then give them their space. Um, they're busy, right? They're they're probably thinking about their speech and what they're going to talk about, and they're they're no place that they're, they're not in the headspace to talk to you, unfortunately. Um, during the event, that's where you want to network and and meet people. Um, after the event, you'll notice everyone rushes to those speakers because they didn't know who was speaking um, <laughs> originally. They probably mm -hmm. didn't do their research and they saw them on stage, and now they want to get you know get in front of them and. And I'll usually just stand back and again, give them their space. So if you came in early, you had your opportunity. That was probably the right moment afterwards or probably tired or done and they want to drink or they want to get out. So um, re you really need to know how to approach the situation. Um, what I try to do is just talk to as many people as you can. Try not to get stuck in one place, um, especially if you're if you're known. I mean, you want to be a good host too. You want to make sure you say hi to the people you, you recognize. Um, but at the same time, I, and if you go with a group of people, for example, if you go, um, if you buy a table to an event, mm -hmm. for an example, it, you get stuck with the people you went with and, or your colleagues, if you go with a group of colleagues, try to go outside of that circle. Don't get so stuck with the people you're most comfortable with. Um, and I see that a lot. They'll have these closed circles, yeah. the same people that are talking with each other. And, and you really want to go outside of that, go outside of your comfort zone because you're there to network. You're there to meet new people. Um, if you've seen that person, you met with that person so many times, it's great to say hi or, Hey, let's catch up later. Um, or, Hey, I'm working, you know, they'll, they'll know if you're, 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 they should know that your, your responsibility is networking and you want to capture and grow your business. Um, they'll respect that, right? Um, so definitely try to speak with as many people as you can. Yeah, I think it's it's a body language sort of thing, right? So if you let's say a team of, uh, you know, say, uh, from the same company, right, or they know each other, they form a circle, so you can't really break in. You know, so I actually try, you know, with people that I know, why don't we open up the circle? So now we're like, spreading out like mm -hmm. to be like a half circle. Immediately, people come uh, talk to us because if you, mm -hmm. you know. It's, it seems like you know they know each other. It's it's kind of hard to break in, you know, for for most people, right? We don't want to dis disrupt the conversation, right? Um, what about? Uh, and I, the, I just want to clear before you mm -hmm. get to. I, I said talk to as many people as you can, but at the same time, it is a quality over quantity, yeah. right? You don't want to just go in and get a bunch of business cards. If you see you're able to, I mean, for me, if I can get one good quality person that I know of, there's some sort of potential or follow-up, um, then I'll spend a lot of time with them, right? Um, but at the same time, you want to be proper and you want to give your attention to other people in the room, right? So you want to be fair in that sense, um, but it definitely is quality over quantity. Um, you don't want to just walk out with 100 business cards and they're meaningless. Um, but um, so you have to be careful and body language is definitely important. What about like the talking ratios? Like are there general guidelines? I talk half of the time, you talk half of the time, or you are you more uh, listening uh, what others are saying? You know, so how how should you you know balance it? Um, for me, I mean, 
I don't want to give away all my secrets, but <laughs> you know, I, I think it's, I never try to get into the sales, um, especially in an event like this. I'm, I'm really trying to get to know the person. Um, and by trying to get to know a person, you're not giving them your background, right? They're not there to meet you in a sense. Um, but it really, you go with the flow of the conversation. Some people are very talkative and to me, that's just easier, right? Like, okay, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. I'll, I'll hear you out. And, and, and to me, it's fine because I'm, I'm getting to know them. Right. But some people are very shy and, and you need to be the one that's, that's a little bit more talkative or be able to ask those open-ended questions to, to learn from them. So it really depends on the dynamics of the conversation. Um, I wouldn't say, you know, you should speak half of the time or give them, but you want to be respectful all the time. Um, but it really depends on the dynamics for sure. Yeah. I really like that. And I think doing the small business show definitely helps. I could, come up with so many open-ended questions mm -hmm. uh, that normally, you know, before I, I, I wouldn't have that. But let me ask you this question, and I know you have a right approach for it. When I need to go, but the other person is still talking about, you know, his wonderful uh, background, right? So what would be a good way to to move on or, or lean on to other uh, contexts that I might be potentially able to meet at the event? Yeah, don't be rude and be like, I have to go to the restroom all the time because <laughs> they'll they'll catch on to that or or I'm gonna go grab a drink. And it is very awkward sometimes. You get stuck in these conversations yeah. and you don't want to be rude and, and just walk away from them. I think honesty is key. Um, I think if you tell them like, hey, I, I'm trying to meet this person or uh let me um, you know, uh I think if you explain your intent that, hey, you wanted to meet this person or the speaker, or you're trying to introduce yourself to this other person, um, excuse me for a moment and just kind of get out of that conversation, um, they'll understand. Um, but if you're kind of fake about it and you're like, oh, I need to go to the restroom, but you don't really go to the restroom or um, it, again, it depends on, on the conference too, right? I mean, mm -hmm. if it's a huge hall and they're not going to see you again, then that's fine. That's can get away with that <laughs> um but if it's a smaller setting uh a lot of times like oh you know what i wanted to speak with that guy do you do you mind and you know you could just walk away from that yeah I'm sorry to cut you off yeah you know a lot it's unfortunate but a lot of these meetings are short and the time goes by fast right so mm -hmm. you have to be able to to utilize your your time um properly as well what one of the the question that I like to ask is you know it's, it's go back to to what you're saying and open and the question you know our acquaintance that I uh, uh, and I just met right we talk you know we have, we have good conversation normally I'll I'll bring up this question you know so what would be a good referral for you and your business if I if I know someone else uh, in in this event that might be a good referral for you I'll make a connection you know that's kind of like me uh, saying to move on. Right. I will introduce you to someone better. Right. You know, you yeah, I may not be your client. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and and again, I, I really steer away from the sale part of it. To me, it's about how can I help you first before mm -hmm. I help myself? If you're if you like what you brought up, if you have that in the back of your mind and that's your approach from from going into any conversation where you're really learning off that person and you're learning off of what their role is and what the responsibilities and how, the, how they're trying to grow. And if you're thinking in the back of your mind, shoot, I know this guy and let me connect them or let me introduce them to this person or let me introduce them to this company or, you know, I have this event coming up. If you're always in that mindset of how can I help you, that feeds off. And they know your true intention is not just to capture a sale, right? Um, so if you're if you have that walking in to a conversation and you're really trying to help that other person, um, I think that builds trust and you're able to really capture the value of that relationship. Yeah, but the the follow up question on the flip side of the coin will be. You know, depending on that person's role, right? For I'm not picking on banker, but let's say a banker, right? So I, I asked, you know, him, I remember the exact conversation. I asked him, you know, what would be a good referral for you? Because he told me uh, all, all all that he could do, you know, at, at his branch, right? He said everyone, right? Mm -hmm. Everyone needs a banking account, right? So that would be everyone. But what should you say to that? Like, do you, should I say everyone or should I be more specific, really, to tell you, uh, to t tell the other person who I really want to meet? 
Um, you know, it, it may not be how they can help. Like bankers, we, we come across them quite a bit, right? There's so many different banks, but they may have a specialty. Mm-hmm. Um, who's your favorite type of customer to, to speak with? Or what's your favorite industry to work in? Um, and really narrow that down, right? Um, because I know people who are in the banking industry, and that's because that's where I came from, but they specialize in treasury department or international banking um, or, or foreign entities. So there's specific roles or specific industries or, or specific um, amounts too. Like I mm-hmm. focus on companies 10 million to 50 million or 10 million below or whatnot. So you really try to narrow that down, right? So obviously we all want to speak to anyone and everyone. Um, but who do they like to work with? I yeah. mean, I think there's a specific industry that they may like to work with as well. If there's someone that wants to work in the construction industry, I work with contractors or that's who I, that's who typically my favorite client is. So um, break it down a little bit further. Yeah, because I, I think that would be a good way to maybe that person really likes you, right? You know, they are really trying to do good and maybe they know half of the people in the room, right? Mm-hmm. That's a sponsor. So by get, getting into a little bit more detail, you're not trying to sell that person, but to tell you who an ideal referral for you would be like, maybe, you know, like Chris has, has, has mentioned, the company size, maybe their, their, their volume, right? For ordering a certain product, or maybe where should they be located? Or maybe they have a special needs, right? That you could feel right away. So if you don't go into the specific, you get into everyone, then you don't really want to meet everyone. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's it's tough to send you a referral um, based. Can I send you that. everyone now? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. So um, be a little bit specific. But again, ask those questions, right? Um, obviously, there, there's more to that. And we want to learn a little bit more about the role of banking is not just banking. There's, there's definitely more to that conversation. And, and it's very meaningful. When I was in banking, I loved helping small businesses that didn't even know, know there were businesses like the landscaper and the house cleaner. And they, they were go and cash these checks. And I'm like, you're a business. Like, how can we form, how can we format this and, and really put yourself in a position to grow rather than just keeping everything underneath your mattress. So um, I really enjoyed helping. And because I'm Hispanic, I really enjoyed helping my Hispanic community and really form formatting their business. And that's how my parents grew. You know, my parents were, were a small company, but they weren't able to grow unless they were able to buy properties and, and, and buy equipment and really grow their business but that came from banking and understanding that that world right and if they didn't have those relationships they weren't they weren't able to grow the way they grew yeah i i think this is one of the best open-ended questions after you greet uh, each other you know who will be a good contact for you that opens up a lot of things and then you can all obviously follow up with question tell me more about that why 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 would be you know, a small business, you know, who are growing, uh, be good for a business, then you can actually learn more about, you know, the others. Maybe it will be a good fit for you. Maybe it will not be be a good fit. But, you know, look, think about the potential uh, referral partner that you're able to get. Mm-hmm. Because if everyone at the meeting knows who you're looking for, chances are next time someone like that comes along, you know, mm-hmm. they will send, they will be sending it to you. You know, and that's probably where my, where my background comes into play, because when I was in banking, um, working in the retail level, I was always referring business. Right. And you would always try to ask those open ended questions and really discover the client. But you would refer them to your mortgage department or to the investment department or to the insurance side of things. So you would always in, in, refer them to in, your internal partners. Right. So it's about listening to your client, understanding the real needs, and then be able to make that referral. So in our case, obviously we're, we're not working in banking, but you're always trying to help that customer and understand their needs. And then if it if I can't help you, then who can I refer you to? So it's kind of the same concept. Yeah. So we had a successful event. You got a lot of business card and I wanted to learn more about your strategy for follow up after the networking event. You mentioned you have a stack of cards, you date them. You know, what other uh, things do you do after the event? Yes. So, again, I'm giving you my trade secrets, right? 
<laughs> I have two. So one of them is the sales journey and the other one's non-sales journey. Um, I kind of break it down. That's my first step. So when I come back to the office and I, I do it within 24 hours. So I really try not to wait longer than that. Like I feel bad right now. I went to an event on Friday and we're Tuesday and I haven't responded. Right. But that was the weekend. But then it kind of gets too late. Like I don't want to wait past another day to respond to the people I met on Friday. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, they'll forget about you. But I, I, those, those, those are my two, two points of contact. So whether they start in my sales journey, I say, okay, there's potential here. They don't know it. I didn't disclose it, but this is my approach. And my approach to that is just following up simply by an email or a phone call. And you can say, Hey, I want to learn more about your role, your organization, um, and really see how we can strategize to work together. Um, you know, give uh, do you have some time in the near future? We could sit down and talk. That would be my 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 approach to the sales journey. The the non sales approach would be someone who I don't see a connection. Um, I try not to waste my time, obviously, because there's only so much time you have in a day. Um, but you still follow up. You never know, right? Mm -hmm. And say, hey, save my contact information. Feel free to leverage me if I, if you need me. I'm another resource for you. Um, and just really just make it a point to follow up. You want to be polite. And you never know. And, and actually, a lot of times, again, they may not be your client, but they may know someone that needs to know you, right? Yeah. So you never know that approach. But you're not going to follow up and follow up and follow up after them, right? With the with the sales journey approach, you want to have those different touch points. You want to make sure that you follow up um, and, and really strategize your approach where you're not too aggressively following up, um, but you're not delaying them or forgetting about them or making them showing them that they're not important to you. Right. So, um, that's kind of my strategy after the event. Yeah. If I have made notes during the conversation at the event, I will mention a couple of what we talk about too, because like you're saying, maybe they talk to 50 other people, right? So kind of remind them what we're talked about, or maybe if I said, I'm going to do something, I, I could do X for you. Do you, are you still interested? You know, or maybe they want to learn more about, you know, what I uh, talked about. So, you know, then it will be also a good excuse, right. To, to connect with them as well. Definitely. Definitely. So do you, do you, how do you use LinkedIn for networking? Do you normally try to connect with everyone on LinkedIn? You know, tell, tell, please tell us some of your, your approach using LinkedIn for networking. If I met you in person, I'm going to connect with you. Okay. Um, it's it's hard to connect with people you don't know. Um, even if there's a mutual connection and there's someone you want to get to know, it's hard for you to kind of go in blindly and just connect with them. Um, they they a lot of the times it's kind of like a cold call. They want to see some relationship there. So if you do see someone that's mutually connected. Maybe they can help you with a warm introduction. Say, hey, I noticed you know this person. Do you know them in, in person or just via connect, uh, LinkedIn? Um, if they know them in person, then help me make that warm introduction. I would really appreciate it. Um, but after an event, that's like that's part of the follow-up. Connect with them on LinkedIn right away. It helps you grow your network. Um, again, whether they're a viable client or not, still connect with them because they'll see what you're up to. They'll see what you're doing, the events you're attending, who you surround yourself with. And it may not be um, something potential now, but you'll be surprised. They'll see you more and more active and they'll reach out to you when they're ready. Um, so definitely connect with them on LinkedIn. Yeah, it's an algorithm, right? You know, once they they see you, you keep uh, showing up on the feed, and you know now you know they they feel like they they know you more. And I know I always see you post uh, networking pieces, right? You know, you always take picture at when you attend the event. What are the some of the suggestion for posting uh, that you would recommend on LinkedIn? Um, LinkedIn obviously is a lot more business oriented, right? So I. I I think rarely I would post something about my family or something personal. Um, I think I, I do it during the holidays. Um, the personal touch that I give to LinkedIn is probably my newsletters. Um, I, I relate that a lot to my my previous positions or what I'm going through currently and just kind of my journey, my personal journey. Right. Um, and it helps. Um, merge those two where your business colleagues can see you in a 
personal side and it makes that relationship a little bit more meaningful right um the other social platforms and believe it or not i just got instagram um this past year and it was because some of those relationships became friendships and they're like hey you don't have instagram i'm like no i don't <laughs> i'm like isn't that just for your dogs or your food um and it's funny because that's what i use it for my dogs and my food probably restaurants and just kind of going out and it's fun right but it's more personal so but that the, will be like business slash personal type relationship yes because instagram's kind of nice the way the layout is where you're able to kind of see like a catalog of pictures right mm -hmm. um but you're able to merge those two because your business is your person and vice versa. Like your, your personality is your business. It's really hard to separate those two nowadays. I think before people were really good with that and not mixing those two. Um, but people want to do business with the people they trust. Mm -hmm. And if you're not able to relay that and to show them who you really are, it's not just a suit and tie every day, right? There's, there's more to me. Um, so I think you open up that dialogue and they really understand you as someone different from what they see you out in those events. And I, and I think it's a, it's a good way, you know, obviously you don't, you want to leave out your privacy, right? If you don't want to share, don't share it because if you post it, it will be there for a long time. And I think it, it kind of helped as a filter too, because, mm -hmm. you know, I believe that there's a match and sometimes there's not a match. If you see that person, maybe the way that they interact, maybe the way that they talk, maybe the way mm -hmm. that they, you know, the things that they believe in, maybe you totally agree with that. Or when you, when you see the certain things that they say, or, you know, maybe this is not a good fit or people that I wanted to be dealing with. Mm -hmm. And I think that's fine. You know, uh, sometimes when, if you force the deal hard enough, you might get it, but later they will become your horrible customer, customer from, from hell, you know, rather, why don't you, wouldn't it be more enjoyable if you can work with all ideal clients who respect you and willing to work with you uh, every day. So I think on the personal stress level, so I think by filtering like that, you actually feel, filtering out people who are you who doesn't connect with you anyway yeah definitely i mean you're you're uh, not that you're not wasting time but you're not wasting their time right so if you don't connect and there's no potential there then let that decision be made up to them um but yeah i think it's tough like i i, I was I was one of those people that were really against social media. It took me a long time to get onto Facebook and Instagram. I mean, just like I said, Instagram, I just logged into or just created an Instagram account. Facebook, I was one of the, the late adapters to it. And I think every social media platform has its use case. Um, LinkedIn definitely is more professional, but you have to give them that personal side of you too, just a little bit, um, because it's not all about business. It's not all about um what you're trying to promote or sell but be a resource like if you see something that's resourceful um comment and and repost and share that especially if it's from people you know right if they're posting something that's Im impactful maybe they're highlighting an event or they themselves have a newsletter um comment and interact with them don't just like um, but really be involved in that discussion right because it helps amplify their message and again, the more you help others, it's gonna it's gonna come back to, towards you twofold. So um, I think with with LinkedIn, again, it's it's tough because you don't want to be too personal, but you do want to be show your personality a little bit, right? Um, and not just all corporate. But again, it is very professional, so don't put put anything that that. Um, you know, it's not professional or ethical, but um, <laughs> I, I think every platform has its his. Um, it's avenue for sure. I think for some uh, for some reason, right? So if you are thinking about what to post on LinkedIn, like you know, Chris just mentioned, next time when you go to a networking event or maybe you're on the field, right? You know, doing what you do uh, for your for your work, take some pictures of you working. So for mm -hmm. some reason, people like that. If I post pictures of products, you know, it'll, it'll be okay. But if I sometimes put pictures of myself and I don't want to be on camera, right, all the time, people like that. It's tough. Trust me. I am. I'm not. I may. It may look like I like taking pictures, but I never like being that person in, in front of a camera, um, mostly because of my weight or whatnot. I just didn't I didn't feel comfortable. So it took me a long time to open it to the chamber. Definitely did open me up to it, but I'm not doing it for me. 
um, even though you see my face everywhere or on my it's on my feed, but I'm really doing it to promote and amplify my members. Um, I'm really helping. I, I want to, if I can help them gain business by attending these events and inviting me to these events, I'm there to highlight those members. And it's not just those people, but those organizations, right? There's a lot of nonprofits that need help, that need their message um, to be amplified. And if I can help in that and by promoting them, because the, the chamber kind of creates this, this center of, of it all, right? And if I can help them promote that, then, then I think that's key, right? And I'm doing it for, and, and, and really just to help make an impact. So question for you would be in a digital world where we could really go to overseas or, you know, make any connection virtually. Do you think an in-person chamber of commerce still relevant for businesses? Definitely. Definitely. I think there's, there's a need. Um, it's, it's harder to network via zoom. Um, I've done it. I think we all have now since COVID. Um, but it's really hard to make that connection, right? A lot of times when you're meeting via zoom, um, it's a presentation and they're giving their, their, their keynote. And then you'll have the chat. People will post their information, but how often are you really establishing that connection, whether you're following up with them or, or emailing them or connecting with them one way or another, it's harder to make that personal approach. Um, but if you are on zoom, um, because it's still relevant, right? Um, if you're on these virtual platforms and these virtual meetings, if there is a person that really interests you, really try to make that attempt and follow up with them and say, Hey, you know, I noticed you work with this company. I would love to learn more. Do you mind if we chat after? Um, so there, there's ways to do it, but in person, I, I am an in-person person. <laughs> so uh, it, it, it comes a lot more naturally and, and, and you're able to really make a personal connection. If you go to in-person events, really get out of your comfort zone. Um, and the more you put yourself out there, the more opportunities. And again, you want to make sure you help others. If you're inviting people to your events, make sure you go attend their events. It's just like a, a party, right? Or a family party. If, you, if you're inviting people to, to come in your home and to come to your kid's party, you want to make sure you do the same and you go to their kid's parties. So um, that's the way I kind of look at it when it comes to networking. Thank you so much. So Chris, for a listener who have individual question about networking, who love to reach out to you, what would be the best way? LinkedIn. Um, so what I did is I created this URL, uh, chrislinla.com. It's basically a link tree. Um, it gives you access to my business card, um, gives you access to all my social media platforms. But I am keynoting an event on May 15th at the City Club. Um, it's basically a follow up to this. It's, it's all about networking. And it would be a great opportunity to, to basically give that presentation in person. So if um, you're interested in attending that, feel free to go to that link and you can register and basically learn a little bit more about the formalities and my approach to things. Uh, again, I have a newsletter that I write on LinkedIn and just try to help others. And I'm, I'm really trying to tie this to the chamber world, right? Really get involved with your local chamber of commerce. Um, if obviously if you're outside of the alley region, get involved in the metro chambers, the large chambers, but really support your local chambers. Um, every city typically has one and it's really gives you a great sense of community to see who lives in that area and what they're about and how you can really help them. Right. Um, it's all about helping small businesses. So if you're able to do that, um, please do so because it, it really makes a difference. And like I said, I come from a family business. We come from a small uh, small business. So um, it means a lot when you really try to help your community. Thank you so much, Chris. And if you haven't done so, go for, uh, do subscribe to Chris' uh, newsletter. It's called Beyond Networking on LinkedIn. You know, this is one of the newsletter that I open right away as soon as I receive it. Chris, thank you so much for coming on to the show today. Thank you. I appreciate your time. Thank you for having me. And thank you for your support, too. I know you do a lot. So, Thank you. This is the end of the episode. If you enjoy our content, uh, please don't forget to like, subscribe, and share. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye-bye.